Hello, my name is Jane Hall. Um, I'm a member of the Design Collective Assemble based here in the UK um, and the author of Breaking Ground, Architecture by Women, uh, published late last year by Fiden. Um, depending on where you're joining us from, good evening. Uh, welcome to this digital talk as part of RIBA, Reba's um, Reba and Vitra talk series. Um, and uh, so this first one is with Jeannie Gang, founding principal and partner of the Global Office Studio Gang. Um, we're thrilled to be streaming Jeannie for this talk, uh, whilst all of us are based kind of across the world, um, some at home and others maybe still at the office. Um, and tonight's event is part of a program of talks which continues to showcase the best in contemporary established and emerging voices in architecture with events taking place in London, um, across the UK, uh, but also internationally. Um, tonight's event is also one of two that are part of the London um, Design Festival 2020. And so on Thursday, the Danish practice 3XN uh, will be next to take the digital stage. Thank you to Vitra Bathrooms who are partnering with uh, the Reba by sponsoring this prestigious series. Um, so Studio Gang was founded by Jeannie Gang uh, in 1997, with staff in four locations across uh, North America and one studio in Paris. The practice pursues a collaborative working method, attentive to materiality and place. Studio Gang's work includes the well-known Aqua Tower in Chicago, which not only was the studio's first tall building, but also earned Jeannie the MacArthur Genius Grant Scholarship. Um, and it's one of the buildings featured in the book that you can see here. Combined with their built work, Studio Gang research, write and teach, thinking of architecture as a holistic practice, not limited to building. That said, the studio is heavily involved in the construction process, working closely with technicians, fabricators, and makers in the production of the work, which is something I, I hope we might hear a little bit more about tonight. Jeannie is a professor in practice at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, uh, where she also studied. Um, and I hope I'm right in saying that the studio focuses on the cultural and environmental aspects of buildings reuse. So there's a strong synthesis between ideas explored in Jeannie's teaching and in the design studio, uh, which foreground issues of ecological and social justice. Tonight's talk will last uh, just over an hour with a lecture by Jeannie, followed by a kind of chaired conversation. Um, as part of your ticket for this talk, uh, you may have purchased the studio's monograph, which we're here to celebrate, Studio Gang Architecture. Um, and this has been made available at a discounted rate by uh, the publisher Fiden. For those who wish to purchase a copy after the lecture, they will be available from the Fiden website for a 20% discount. Um, I'm going to hang over to Jeannie in a minute, but before I do, there's just kind of a couple of housekeeping points. Um, we are live streaming tonight's event, so we cannot see or hear anyone in the audience. Um, I hope you're all out there. Uh, if you experience any issue or have any queries, uh, please email talks at riba. Dot org um, and someone will get back to you um, and if you are on social media feel free to use the hashtag RIBA Vitra uh, with the A of Vitra capitalized. Um, so that's all from me um, and I'm very happy to hand over to Jeannie Gang for this uh, Reba and Vitra talk. Over to you Jeannie. Thank you Jane. Um, hi everyone and uh, thanks for inviting me to share and sharing some time with me today because um, I'm really happy to be with you, even though I can't see you. Um, I wanted to introduce myself and my practice to those of you who might know, not know us as well. Um, and to do that, I'll walk through um, some of the projects that are in the book and, and the Studio Gang Architecture a publication. Um, but I also want to give you some more background um, and talk about things, things that are going on around us these days. Um, as was mentioned, um, I have these four different offices, four different locations. And one reason why you might not be as familiar with the work of Studio Gang is that in many ways, even though uh, we were uh, titled global practice in the intro, we we're kind of a very local practice in a certain way in these different offices. Um, our teams are from the place that the office is, um, and 
we like to uh, do work that is in and around those places very much um, as people really want to be uh, hands-on to each of the projects. Though we also work together across the four offices. Um, and so many of the projects that are in the book you will see are, are in or around these places. Um, so it's a kind of important, I think, to be, to be local now and not the, uh, the bad parts of local, which might be cause people to be more um, nationalistic or try to be around people that are just like them. But I think being local is, is really a very important thing to, to know a place. Um, one of the first projects uh, I worked on was a, um, I'm just getting my clicker to work here. Oops. There, oops, back. Sorry about that. Uh, one of the first projects um, that I worked on was a nature center on the south side of Chicago in the former industrial part where uh, pollution unfairly impacts the community there. Um, and in doing this project and getting to know the community, I also got to know about birds and migration. We're actually in migration time right now in North America. Um, and it really introduced me to the wonders and this like kind of great variety of birds there are that move cities. So I'm part of this eBird, that's my profile there, an eBird and part of the citizen science project where you identify and uh, document bird sightings. Uh, but but that calls our attention to this issue of of global. What is interesting about the good part about global, even where when right now um, there are rightfully many questions about um, globalization and and its impacts. So I think this is another really fascinating part about how to operate in the situation situation we are in right now. Um, I was, I found this this morning, a friend, a colleague sent this image from Instagram, his Instagram shot of our building in San Francisco with the eerie orange skies that are, have been impacted by the um, wildfires there. Um, and it brought to mind the issue of um, how this is impacting, that air pollution is actually creating a more difficult situation for people with uh, COVID-19 or, or making it easier to get COVID-19. Uh, but it's also impacting things like bird migration where uh, uh, birds that had to fly all the way around the city um, have ended up in, in serious trouble on their migration route. So um, this book, getting back to the book, um, is really about these kind of relationships that are created through um, the environment, through people and nature. Sorry, I'm going a little bit back and forth there. I have a delay, there we go. So, so we're gonna get back to the book, which is really about these uh, projects and how they connect to connect all these different elements about environment, people and places and communities. Um, and, and how we've really um, addressed all of our work toward those, those connections. Um, in, in making this book, I think it's interesting, it really helps you to focus in on and edit and kind of get to what's really important. This is an image of us, you know, with me and Alyssa, uh, who helped me internally find the projects and edit them down. Um, we, we really started to look at our past projects and, and how they relate to one another. So this is a diagram I had made that um, you can read um, across from time from the left to right, but also in the Y scale is the amount of people that were working on any one of these projects at any one time. And the yellow projects are the, one, the ones that are included in the book. So we really included things from our very beginning all the way through to um, later projects and recent ones. Um, it also, we realized that we didn't really have pictures of some of our beautiful models that we made. So um, we, we really had to, as you can see in this image, take models up to our rooftop and, and photograph them anew for this, for this project. 
which was really fun. And, um, and it really produced some beautiful shots like this one uh, that shows Diana looking over the model of, of um, the Chicago airport. And it's just such a great shot. Uh, we wouldn't have had that without the book. Um, to start with, there, the book is divided into these kind of different families of projects. Um, and I found that um, we could have the family, some projects could fit into more than one family, um, but they, they really, it really started to help us um, to clarify uh, their, their purpose. And this first project that I wanted to show is in the, in the section of the book called What Are You Made Of? And that really, that chapter really helps us to talk about our practice that is very um, experimental um, with materials, um, but also looking for those connections to place through materials. Um, the project that one project included there um, is called Stone Stories. And this project was about the, um, the city of Memphis, uh, where we are currently working um, with, with Memphis and the parks. Um, and what we, while we were working on this project, a kind of a master plan of the parks there in Memphis, we discovered this really big, amazing strip of um, cobblestones. And it was kind of desolated as you can see in the picture. And, and when we tried to talk to people about the history of this place, we got a lot of different answers. Some people thought that it was a very important um, historic place that needed to be preserved. Other people didn't know it was there. And some people had a negative reaction because of this place uh, we found out uh, was really originally a, um, a landing for these river boats along the Mississippi River. Um, and there was, um, that was a place where the cotton trade was very strong. So that means that um, enslaved people had worked on the stock uh, in the cotton industry. Um, and so there was a negative reaction to this, this place. So uh, meanwhile, um, as we were designing and trying to understand all this history, um, we, we found that um, the city of Memphis um, and activists there wanted to remove two Confederate statues from the city and they were able to do that. So there was a lot going on um, at this time and we got to thinking, um, would it be possible to, to um, make a new kind of monument and not these figures on horses, uh, but to actually have a, a kind of new horizontal monument, this, this place and, and to somehow uh, relate these complex history histories. Um, so this project really ended up being about listening to people's stories. Um, and um, this is us recording the stories from different Memphians, um, all kinds of people from different uh, fields, um, community leaders. Uh, there were um, artists and storytellers. And what we did was take their stories down, write them down, draw sketches, um, film their stories. Um, and then we um, continued to try to figure out how we could make this new kind of horizontal monument and not really a monument, but uh, some kind of marker of this place. Uh, this is just a work in process. And finally, this is um, what we started to do, which was try to embed the stones themselves with these stories. There we go. So um, after we had these sketches, we um, try to imbue these stories into the stones themselves. Um, and then in, in doing so, create more of a connection uh, between this place and the people that live there today. Um, and there were amazing people that we talked to. There was um, an 80 year old man that was had once marched with Dr. Martin Luther King and we heard his story. Um, here you can see some of the process of making it and some of the stones that resulted from this, this process. Um, and so what's, what's interesting, I think, as we go forward with Memphis and planning uh, the rest of this waterfront along the Mississippi River, um, we, we are now um, taking that process of listening 
to a greater level. We've, we've started um, a whole series of sessions, um, listening to people's stories. I think this is kind of what I want to say here is just that we don't know how to create something until we connect with the local people. And, and I think it's really important and it's a process that we are continually refining. Uh, we started here with a, a design leadership group with students. Um, there's a picture coming. I think, <laughs> hold on. There we go. Um, this is um, a group of high school students that we worked with to um, to design, uh, do a workshop with them to design uh, places along the park, um, and and this was really an enriching process for us and for for them. And the idea that we can introduce um, design as a field to to more groups and make it a more inclusive process. Okay, so. Um, that was really talking about one chapter, I guess, but also this work that involves material and community. I think our practice was always um, engaged with its surroundings, um, not always in projects, but sometimes like through books. This is a book uh, that we made called Reverse Effect that was uh, really about the Chicago River um, and what was needed to do to renew this river. I think architects have, a, a skill of being able to communicate uh, with, with images, with drawings, but also process a lot of different kinds of information that comes from um, technical fields, history. And, and, and what we can do with that is really help move ideas forward that improve our places for all of us. Um, Chicago's river, of course, is very uh, polluted and dirty. Um, and it's famous for having um, reversed the flow of the Chicago River uh, to improve the drinking water. But what happened during that process um, was that um, the river has lots of problems today, like the wa poor water quality. Uh, you can see in the sign there, it has people have flooded basements because it's such a managed waterway. Um, and there are even invasive species moving up the Mississippi, threatening to get into Lake Michigan. But there's also a lot of potential. So there's the industry is moving away and there's really the chance to, the clicker's uh, not exactly working. Maybe I could just say next. Hey, thanks. I'll do it that way. Um, so there's a potential to kind of uh, reclaim this area around uh, the river and to improve it. And so um, what, what was really interesting about this is that um, we we discovered that people really um, will, they didn't even know about the river is there sometimes because it was always dominated by this private industry. Um, but the first step in improving the river is really uh, getting people to feel like they own it. And so that was um, a major step that we thought we needed to do. And to, to get people to feel like they own it, um, we want to introduce, um, sorry, my clicker. <laughs> we want to introduce um, the idea of, of access to the river. So this project now, which started out as a book, is turn is it started out with reverse effect is now turning into um, a project that came out of this book of of looking at the future of the Chicago Riverway, and so the project is in the rhythm section of the book. Um, here you can see uh, the project at night. It's a boathouse um, and a, a field house for giving access to the youth of Chicago um, this this river access. So here you can see in the film that's running now, um, how people are suddenly invited to use this river, even though it was still a little dirty, um, the best way to get people to um, get active in cleaning it is really to let them have access. We were so inspired by uh, these kind of stop gap film, stop gap 
pictures that um, represent motion. Um, and we kind of turn that into a roof form that creates the, the Clara stories for the building and gives it this dynamism uh, that will encourage people to come use the river. And, and it has done so. Um, you can see this was during construction. Most of this project was made out of very low cost, very all straight elements, but moving slightly um, in position to create this flow of, of the roof form. And now it's really, the river is being used so much more and it's just the first step, but um, there are other projects by other architects too, going along the river and really helping people to feel this ownership and feel the care for this, for this waterway like never before. Um, I think rhythm has always been something that has shown up in our work in various ways. And it is a, a formal fascination, let's say with movement and trying to bring life to architecture, which is otherwise still. Um, and so this Moybridge his photos were always interesting because they really express um, how rhythm is a natural feature as well. And we can think about rhythm in terms of the movements of the sun. We can think of it as uh, movements of nature. And then in, in the boathouse, it really was this, this kind of motion that attracted people to come use it in new ways. These are some of the interiors, as you can see, they're really using very like plywood ceilings and, and very simple materials in order to um, express this. And it's now being used for things like um, returning veterans who are learning how to row and, and also uh, inner city kids who, who can now um, learn rowing in a big city like Chicago. And, and it's really helping them get into colleges as well. Um, can be used for various activities like yoga, for example, um, and, and also studying after school, which is, you can go to the next one, um, which is also um, an important aspect of these community buildings. Um, and you can go to the next one. So there are now two of these, and um, that takes me to Rhythm and another project, which is um, more about this visual rhythm that also implies connectivity between residents. So we've been doing a lot of projects that study um, outdoor space for residential uh, projects um, and, and how residents that are living in taller buildings and bigger buildings can actually get outside. This one explores the balconies uh, that I call balcony stems. Uh, you can see on, on the plan, the, these stems change um, as they go up the building. Um, and they provide these outdoor stoops, if you will, for people to meet their neighbors or at least um, be able to hang out. And of course, in, during this time of, of um, the pandemic, it has become more important than ever to be able to have that kind of relationship with someone um, when you can't even get together um, in person. So these, these have worked out really well, as you can see how these elements add up to create this uh, vibrant facade. Um, the project I showed you earlier in San Francisco is also in this section of rhythm. And here we were really thinking more about the rhythm in terms of the way this project grows out of the ground, uh, but also um, in the way that, maybe you can go to the next one. Um, you can see th these, these balconies and bay windows um, kind of rotate around the building. And, and, and this idea was um, really an idea about um, capturing the quality of um, the bay area, which is really is dominated by a lot of the older buildings that have bay windows, which bring in like different directions of light um, from different orientations and also provide different views. So um, with this project, we worked on um, a movement of these, um, if you could go to the next one, a movement of these balconies that 
um, help to create a very almost um, like active, but also a, a, a very like moving building in a certain way, which is unusual for a tall building to be. Um, these are some, some other views and this is just finishing up now, this project. Um, and that's again, the one that was shown with the red skies, but um, hopefully the skies will have rain in San Francisco very soon. Um, one of the chapters is called flow and the flow chapter is explores um, movement again, but, but one that is, um, can be defined as the movement of people through space, um, the movement of, of materials, uh, the liquidity, let's say, of certain materials, um, and the, the forms that geologic flow can, can have. So this has been a preoccupation of ours, of mine, um, but I think uh, for artists in, over time as well, where um, you can look at sketches by um, artists from hundreds of years ago studying the eddies and whirls in water, uh, for example, but it's also intersects very much with science. Um, um, we now have much more information about flow and these invisible forces that, um, that produce patterns that we see in nature. Um, and um, probably the most well-known project of ours is the Aqua Tower, which um, we designed uh, to kind of respond specifically to its site. So uh, it creates a, a kind of almost topography, a vertical topography with relationships between the hills and valleys of the facade to areas around the building. So that by, by being in those places on the building, one could have views um, out to uh, those different parts of the city that you wouldn't get normally with, with a straight up and down building. The other thing that these topographies do is allow the residents, again, to connect with one another um, and see each other, much like you would do if you were looking over your backyard if you lived in the suburbs to, to see your neighbor. So a kind of a way to connect for people on a tall building to be part of the city and part of the building at the same time. And if you could go to the next one. The next one, please. Thank you. Um, and so you can see here how those patterns add up uh, to create a very um, engaging uh, facade, but, but I think one that, that um, really has similarities to things you would find in, in natural elements, if you go to the next one. Oops, there we go. Um, there, this is uh, some outcrops of rocks around um, Lake Michigan, which is in near Chicago, but those uh, limestone rocks are worn down by wind and water producing kind of topog vertical topography in a certain way. And on the right, um, uh, ripples in the, the sand left from the um, pattern of the way water flows over this material. Um, and as you see this building from pedestrian point of view, it really get, it, it rewards the pedestrians uh, that are walking by as well with lots of three-dimensional views. Um, after this was the kind of first tall building that uh, we had ever done, and I was really um, interested in you know why we would do a project like this and, and it, at the time in my career I never thought I would be able to do design a tall building I, I really didn't think that was in my future <laughs> and uh, uh, but but uh, the the owners invited me to to do a design um, and and we took a moment to research and to, to understand what it meant from a carbon perspective to put a, a residential building in a city like Chicago, uh, where people that live there would then have be able to walk to work and to walk to all the things around them and, and really um, producing a footprint for that household, which is much smaller than um, it would be if compared to if one lived in a suburban um, environment. Um, 
pattern. Um, there's also this aspect of the social. I mean, high rises were were um, considered to be very isolating, um, and so um, these are some of the factors that went into helping us decide to make these generous balconies up, even if it was an 86-story uh, building, to create outdoor places where people could gather and, and also see their neighbors. And this is just a little view of the project and how it looks uh, today. So this, this whole project, I, I already showed you some of the balcony studies on, on later projects, but this one really, the flow has to do with the, the materiality and how it allowed us to explore those um, different balcony types on every floor and, and to, to avoid the repetition that you normally would see. Um, this project, the Arcus Center for Social Justice Leadership um, is a really interesting project for the idea. We really, it was hard to put this into uh, this category or, or deciding between uh, this and another chapter because it fits in many of them. I think it really is a touchstone for us. Um, but this project, um, they asked us to design a place for students that are studying social justice and are going on to be leaders in social justice. Are, um, and so it's located in Kalamazoo College, a very small uh, college in Michigan, in Kalamazoo, Michigan, the little pink dot there. Um, on a campus that is dominated by uh, ma masonry buildings, but um, historic styles, um, and some even would call this a kind of a neo-colonial style, which really didn't fit the social justice mission of, of the project. Um, but they wanted to have a project that would um, be about social justice. And, and so to really, to do this one, you really have to look at where social justice is practiced. Um, mainly in the streets as, you know, uh, through demonstrations, uh, like we're experiencing right now with the Black Lives Matter movement. It's really about um, getting out into the public space. Uh, but if you look behind that, where are those um, demonstrations are planned? It's often in places that are hidden from view, uh, maybe like in, in a basement or a kitchen counter. Um, and so here we wanted to, um, they wanted to have this be a more visible process. Um, and um, we looked really toward community meeting centers around the world that uh, where people gather. Um, a lot of times they gather around fire or water or the elements. Um, and a lot of times they're facing one another. So these were inspirations for us uh, to create this building with a central gathering place, a very intimate space around a fireplace and a kitchen, which are two elements that really came up in our um, talks with, with the community about uh, what would help break down these barriers to and to allow people to talk about these sometimes very difficult issues, um, human rights, uh, um, LGBTQ issues, and, and how do you make people feel comfortable in doing that? This place really can be used by a few, but it, it also has a central gathering space that can expand kind of outward to um, accommodate a lot more people and connect to the, this flow of visitors uh, changes from maybe sometimes just a few students to very big groups. Um, the plan also flows uh, um, where you can see things from every part of the building. Um, but, but creating um, acoustically separated spaces at the same time um, and connecting to nature that's around it as well. Just, can you go to the next one? Thank you. And so these three different areas that it connects to are um, um, the campus itself, this natural grove and a residential area, if you go to the next one. Um, and it's, uh, the materiality for this really has to do with, you know, how could we do something very low carbon um, along the lines of, of environmental justice, um, something that is sustainably harvested and fair practice. Um, we, we found uh, that this white cedar could be used. It's, it's um, range is in 
Michigan, so it's local and nearby. And um, during the design process, we stumbled upon this incredible barn and several other different types of buildings that were over 100 years old that use this technique uh, called uh, cordwood masonry. Um, and so we, it really became our project to kind of um, recapture this technique um, through in inviting some vernacular um, architects, not even architects, people were untrained that knew how to do this. Um, there were still just very few people in the country that had done this for very small scale. So our project was really about, you know, could we do this for a bigger project? And it's a great technique because it, it really keeps the carbon in the material. Um, you dry the, the logs um, after they're felled. Uh, so while the carbon, you know, is really, the tree really is carbon, it is absorbing carbon and becomes a tree. Um, so you don't need very much work on these material and it can be laid up just like masonry. So it's, it's load bearing in itself and it also um, is easy to, to do for anyone who's a mason. So we also had community participation with this. So in a way, this technique really connected to uh, the mission of the project, but also um, expressed the di diversity of, of people in a certain way, like every tree has its own unique rings, if you go to the next one. Um, and it can really express what went on in that tree's life. <laughs> if there was a drought, if, if it was um, an urban tree or, a tree from the countryside. Um, and you can see how it weathers really beautifully as well. So this, these are photos of, of it after like year three on weathering differently on each side of the building. Um, one more project in, in this flow chapter, which so you can start to see that these projects are are different, but there's something binding them together. This is a new wing that is currently in construction for the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Um, it's a venerable old institution that um, has kind of grown organically over time, I guess. Um, you can see this campus here made up over 20 different buildings. And when the building was first built, this was the way that uh, they displayed and collected natural history specimens. You know, in a very, and um, over time, uh, their faculty has grown and they are a very well known teaching institution. They use uh, a lot of um, interesting techniques like using an MRI machine to, to explore their collection. So it's a kind of almost a living co collection that is providing new clues uh, to materials and natural history and cultural objects even over time. Um, and when it was first built, it, the plan was to build this kind of four quadrangled uh, building with a central axis. Um, but that's not what, the way that they proceeded. They, they proceeded immediately filling into the courtyards and um, adding on and, and um, in many different styles. So it's, it's very eclectic as well. This was a view from the 1930s. Uh, the yellow dot is where the new wing will go. And oops. Um, so you can see here this axis that uh, the building is, is actually on, um, on 75th Street um, and on the west side of Central Park. Um, and so with all of those additions that had gone on over time, um, it started to lose that axis. This is the um, astrophysicist who leads uh, that part of the collection in, in, in the museum. His name is Neil deGrasse Tyson. And he actually coined a term uh, that is now in the dictionary called Manhattan Henge. Um, and if you remember the last slide, the Manhattan is slightly skewed. It's not directly north up. So in Manhattan, you have this natural event uh, that happens and occurs um, two times a year where the sun sets directly on axis with the Manhattan grid. 
Um, and it's become a pretty crazy event. Everybody gets out in the streets and takes pictures during the Manhattan Henge event. Um, but it, it struck me in the very early stages of this um, competition that um, that the building could do something to create more excitement about um, science and, and science careers and, and science education. Um, and maybe it could even connect through this um, almost a natural canyon um, down the axis of Manhattan down 75th Street. So that was just really a concept sketch. Um, and, and this is a little bit later as we started to develop what this, all the potential of what this uh, kind of canyon like um, central atrium could be. Um, this is exploring that idea and plan. So what's really interesting I think about this building was we had to somehow connect all these disparate parts I was showing you uh, with a with this building, but but also make it connect to um, existing galleries and and make movement a lot more fluid. So it really ended up being a lot about the movement of the space of people through the space. Um, and getting people excited about um, science again. Maybe you can hit the next one for me. Thank you. Um, and let's go to the next one. So you can see all these new connections that were made on the right by this uh, new design. Next one, there we go. So here um, in part of the preparation for designing this building, we we wanted to look at landscapes that were about flow and movement, um, looked at a lot of, of eroded canyons like the one there on the left, which is the last one we visited on our trip out west. And it, it, it really had the dimensionality of what this um, atrium space would be um, like. It was very similar in scale. So it was, it was a small canyon, very interesting. interesting. Um, and, and we really studied a lot of uh, geologic formations and that have to do with flow and movement. These are, that's from um, Arches National Park. And there's also a lot of this, this use of, of water to erode um, rock or ice was informational for us as well. And to do, to study it, um, we started in the computer, but you know, it was really the programs were not producing the right kind of, of feeling that we were aiming for this was kind of, um, so we tried working with blocks of ice. This is in Chicago and uh, very cold weather. We were able to use um, a little mini torch and, and a hairdryer to uh, hot water to melt the ice. Um, and, and that started to really produce some interesting um, conditions that we were able to then, uh, you know, scan and use in the computer as well. So here are some pictures of that melted model. It doesn't exist any longer because it melted, but um, um, it really did produce a lot of um, interesting form that that connected to flow and also got people, you know, felt like this landscape, interior landscape that one could explore. Um, mind you, this is a structural form as well. Um, it, we needed it to, you can go to the next one, please. We needed it to be able to support itself. It's not kind of added on. Um, and so really what it is, is this um, volume, which has a space inside that is um, um, supporting all the floors around it. Next one. That's the section. Um, and this is the materiality with the flow that we are using to produce. Um, we can do it without formwork. So this is using a uh, shot crete, um, uh, concrete also with um, as low emitting as possible, um, but it, we are also able to uh, reduce the amount of material used by not using formwork. Uh, this, this is on the left is uh, studying some infrastructure that has used that technique in New York. So the technique is there, only um, not really used for architecture usually. Here is a big mock-up of one of the portals into one of the galleries. 
Um, and this kind of shows an X-ray through uh, the, the walls of the canyon into this visible collections where we'll be able to show science in action. Uh, this is the facade of it and how it, it meets, it doesn't have much facade really. It's a very small piece that meets the park. Um, most of this project goes in and, and connects throughout. And this is kind of what the visuals of the interior space will be like where, you know, um, people will be able to discover and have careers in science. It turns out like the United States kids are like the, the rating of our science um, education is like 26th in the world. It's very bad right now. And as a kind of, as you know, crisis in um, science education because we have people that are also denying that there is even climate change. So um, this ends up becoming a very important project for that reason alone. Next. That's from the rooftop looking down over Manhattan Henge, um, which will um, probably be a big event at some point in the future. And this is uh, looking down the axis. Okay, so the, the last group of projects I wanted to talk about, I'm gonna speed up really fast now so um, we can have a discussion with Jane, but um, the group called Toward Terrestrial. Um, I owe that title to Bruno Latour, uh, who, uh, whose work I really appreciate, but um, where he is talking about how we really need a new vector to aim at. We've been in a trajectory of modernism um, for you know, the last couple hundred years, and um, we had the left and the right, um, but everybody was moving towards modernity. Um, but now it's because of this um, stalemate on, on climate, uh, we really need to aim our sights along another vector, um, which he calls terrestrial. Um, um, next pro next um, slide. Um, so I mentioned in the beginning that uh, one of the, my earliest projects was this nature center um, located on the south side of Chicago in this very former industrial area. Um, and this project completed in 2004 um, is actually in the book because it was such a touchstone for us. Um, and it was really a project about starting with what's there, using the materials of the surrounding area, reclaiming them and, and using them to make a building that is metaphorically like a nest, maybe not looking like a nest, because um, it, but the process being like a nest. And I remind you that this area is a very important area for migratory birds um, and, and the uh, people that live there who are, you know, probably families that are, uh, that whose, whose uh, parents or grandparents uh, once worked in those Chicago industries, but they've turned their sights to the natural environment. Um, at the same time, they are um, being, they are suffering from a lot of industrial pollution, industrial era pollution, and also landfills that keep locating near, near them. So it's a very strong um, group there that has uh, fought for environmental justice. And can you turn to the next one? Um, there's also this issue of, of collisions with glass, birds that are flying through migration when they encounter cities with buildings made of glass. Um, there's a huge amounts of mortality there. Um, if you go to the next one. That's just one day's collection during migration. And, and um, so, so this building had to both be somehow built from what's around it with these showing the column clusters made of different types of steel that are reclaimed, the next one. And also it had to protect birds from crashing into the, the glass they can't see. So it was in, um, encompassed, it was to be encompassed by this um, metal mesh screen. Um, and uh, this is the plan really was a plan that um, would have been the highest lead category at the time and and reduce carbon. Um, this project never was built, but um, it was so influential for us having won the competition um, and tried to carry on with these um, ideas throughout all of our projects afterwards. 
uh, this project really comes, um, it's, it's a kind of, like I said, a touchstone. It's a project that really resonates still with us. Um, and, and finally, this project, which is the Lincoln Park Zoo Nature Center. Uh, um, it was a project that uh, they asked us to design a pavilion in this park that's right next to a zoo. Um, but when we started it, you know, bringing these attention to ecology to this project, um, we, we started thinking bigger picture about the whole site and the whole place. Um, this is the location, so it's right, just right inside the city of Chicago and it's right next to skyscrapers, but it was um, adjacent to the lakefront as well. Maybe you can go to the next one for me. Thank you. Um, and so this now, a few years in, um, you can see how we have renovated this pond. Oops, um, I'll just stay there. It's also become a place to study urban wildlife. Um, so this is um, the eBird checklist on the right and on the left images of, of the tracking that they're doing with different species of turtles. So we, we actually made this pond much deeper so fish could winter over and it could become a true habitat and also a piece of water, if water um, stormwater infrastructure. So over the, the year since it was completed in 2008, um, there, 10, sorry, 2010, um, we now have something like 400 pair of, of nesting um, black crowned night herons there, which is just one symbol of how the park has increased its biodiversity. Um, there's, there's also um, an urban wildlife study group that has formed and they are tracking all of these things. So the, this is um, images of now you can see these coyotes which uh, come to the park regularly and on the left some um, a group of skunks, a family of skunks. Um, here's a, um, a great blue heron under the, the bridge there. So it's really become a vibrant place. So what I like about this project is really that um, it connects people to each other and to their environment. Uh, these are milkweed pods that were part of the inspiration for the roof structure, as you can see in the model here. Um, oops, and then you can see those, I'll go back one. You can see these um, fiberglass pods that are being um, installed in, into the wooden lattice, um, made of wood lamellas. So this creates a beautiful kind of light. Um, and the idea was that this pavilion would be for uh, classes to come out and learn about plant, pond life, um, but it's really become much more than that. And it's really connecting people to each other. And if you can go to the next one. It's become a place for dances. Next one and um, a very popular place for yoga as well. And if you go to the next one, it's also become kind of like the most popular place for people to uh, have engagement photos taken. And you can just cycle through these next few images. Next one. These are just pictures from the internet. Next one, next one, next one, next one. Okay, good. And so um, they're back. Okay, okay, good. So um, things happen there that, that aren't even planned. This was um, an event where it's an impromptu event called Dine en Blanc, where people bring a picnic basket, they dress up in, in a white clothing and, and they sat all along the boardwalk uh, to um, have this outdoor dinner. Um, so, those are most of the projects in, in the book and I just wanted to end on our own office experiment here. Um, this is the Chicago office with a green roof and um, we were really interested in this aspect of connecting people to each other through um, biodiversity. And, and um, we installed on our roof, a green roof, but not just any green roof, one that has a really wide variety of 
of regional plants. Um, and here it is from above. Um, and so again, this is kind of ending on a project that isn't doesn't really have an owner. I mean, we're the owner, we're the client, I guess, on this. But but we wanted to do something to um, to take action for climate and loss of species, um, but also do something that can help us to connect to each other. So we call it the Sky Island, but um, it's really this um, green roof with um, trees, plants on, on, on our roof. And you go to the next one. Um, and, and we've installed, we have a kind of a glass pavilion up there where we installed this um, glass that has bird frit on it, which prevents bird strikes uh, that you can see on the right hand side. Next one. Um, we have bees up there. So we have activities that, that bring us closer together. Next one. We produce our own honey now. Um, and we do a bio blitz. So every year, and this week is our bio, bio blitz, we'll do a 24 hour um, recording and, and documentation of all the species that can be found um, on this rooftop. And so it is really an event that, that brings us closer together, um, but it's also using our own space as a, um, as a place to experiment and as a place for data collection. Um, and I think this is really one of the most exciting things, ongoing things that we're, we're working on right now. Um, we just thought that we could use our own place. Here's some of the um, scientists that, that collaborate with us to log the species that we find. And I think there, you can see this, this is a very um, text intense slide, but, um, Biodiversity is rated with a, an index uh, called the floristic uh, index, and we we found that you know how hard it is for for diversity to come back. If you look at um, the loss of old growth forests and then uh, the era of farming, it it takes years, hundreds of years, for biodiversity to come back. So um, it is really important to um, to work on this issue because this is um, part of what's happening with climate change is the loss of this biodiversity. And so um, here you can see we added some old logs to the rooftop later on to try to get our numbers even higher. And we've now been rated as a floristic landscape. Um, so we, we crossed a threshold with, with our own project. Um, and so it's really considered a quality habitat. And it's a place for all of us that we use in this urban environment. Uh, so those are our, our data over the last years. Um, um, you can see some of the new species are actually fungi because of adding the logs. So things like that have helped. Um, um, and now we're taking this into the next phase. So kind of just to kick off where, or what we're doing next is to um, look at air quality and see how the rooftop is actually affecting air quality because air quality um, is something that impacts city dwellers adversely and especially um, groups that are, are um, disinvested, uh, their neighborhoods are disinvested and they have no green space. So could this possibly be a way to start to improve air quality if everyone were to have um, green roofs? So um, as we said in the beginning that the COVID is also attacking um, places that have higher levels of, of pollution. So the goal for this um, is to then engage high school students as well and kind of a, a data collection. Um, so it's kind of a, a project that um, it might seem small, but we think that over time, this, this could really spread and we're working with our, our neighbors to actually, you know, see if it's possible to add green roofs all around. So with that, um, I wanna thank you all very much and be happy to speak with Jane at this point. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jeannie. Um, as you can see where I am, it's got a lot darker. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm very different time zone, but I have a kind of similar light 
kind of effects coming in. Um, it's really great to hear you speak through some of the projects. I've obviously kind of like looked at the book, which is sort of beautifully illustrated, but it feels like there's, you know, a much richer story um, behind every project. And as you say, potentially they could have been fitted into many chapters because of the kind of dialogue between them. Um, and so I thought maybe we could just start kind of with what you sort of speak to in the introduction of, of the book about the idea of the big idea, um, the big ideas that move us. And I suppose as a book project that looks back at 20 years of work, what would you say are the big ideas that have stayed and which are the ones that have kind of come and gone? Are there any big ideas that are now small ideas or trends you can see? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the, the issue of this biodiversity, the, the idea of toward terrestrial that I mentioned and in, encapsulated in, in that one chapter is really pervading almost all of our, our projects. Um, and in, in, in different amounts. And, and it's really, I think now what I'm seeing is possibilities for um, to connect that and social justice together um, in, a, in our projects. What I think is really interesting is, so those are the kind of big ideas. It's climate change, obviously, the, the one of the, the major factors of our time um, and social in, inequity. You know, when I first started working in Chicago, I was working on uh, small projects and they were all community centers, it seemed like. And so I got to know a lot of the different communities in Chicago in this kind of mosaic of, of different um, neighborhoods that are there. Um, but then you see this, you see the inequities and, um, but, but bringing together what's happening with, with climate, I, these are, this is where we have to move uh, toward. And, and so, what I see happening now is even though we're working on tall buildings and sometimes buildings with, um, you know, much bigger budgets and, uh, but, but we're trying to also bring some of these qualities into those projects as well, like in how they are um, delivered, how, how they can each one of them and, and, and working with the owners of those projects to, to think through how could we have a positive impact on, on the community that will be, that is around this building or that is impacted by the building. So it is, it is all relating uh, really to those, those kind of big idea issues. Um, and the book was a way to try to make uh, them hang together in, in, in clusters of, of ideas as opposed to, you know, being formally identical or something like that. Yeah. Which way around did it come? Did you kind of have these ideas for the themes and then try and assign projects? Or was it you started to see themes develop by clustering projects together in different ways? Or is there a kind of third <laughs> different uh, No, it was kind of both of those things. I, we, we, I think people um, had mentioned to me that, um, they thought that every project was totally different in our work. And, um, and yes, we are being specific, but there are these common um, ways that they relate. And it, it might be through programmatic approach or it might be through material or it might be through form as well. Um, and so um, we started to try to name them. I guess that was the first, what are the, the names of these categories? <laughs> Um, and but it really does help in producing a book to um, formalize your thinking to to articulate your ideas and and it, it actually helps you in in your work as well as you move forward and the um oh, i've just um thinking through sort of what you just said about um you know working on such different scales of work from the kind of early community centers and the fact that the Aqua Tower was your first tall building, which I kind of find extraordinary because it seems like such a mature piece of work, you know? Um, and I didn't realize that when I first saw it, I must've been discovering you early on. Um, but how important have your clients been to, um, in a way, getting behind your ideas and 
also taking them with you you know mm. projects are, take a long time they meet lots of barriers so um yeah I'd be really interested to know how you manage to kind of bring people outside the studio kind of on your journey yeah no that's a great question because I always see these projects as being co-created with the clients um you know if not the clients then the community um so the process is really one of engaging early on in dialogue about ideas we actually usually have like a book club for our projects um, um, where the relevant topics are brought together in a, in a kind of bibliography and and then we and in some of those t titles um, would be offered by the the clients for example like um, in the writer's theater which i didn't show today we, we were um, we had a really interesting book list including you know books that i would have never come across if not for uh, the client offering them up um, so that's one way um, but but also in the production of the the first ideas after this research phase um, we usually are not afraid to show something very sketchy very rough and multiple ideas and that way i feel like the the clients can be more engaged and they can help to edit or guide or direct you know which way that project's going to go and and the i feel that the success of the projects it really uh the way that they get moved forward um is much stronger when there is that involvement so you know it it's and besides it's more fun right than working in a vacuum <laughs> uh, to engage the people around you do that very much with your work yeah i think um you know the client is supposedly well it's the person who's there kind of throughout and i suppose within your studio people must come and go right like you have it seems like you've kind of established a really strong studio culture in several different locations um but often the life of the architect can be quite transient yes. um, and you know you talk to how um projects can take you know architecture takes a long time um and so what are what are some of the kind of in-house methods for yeah. keeping these ideas present yeah i think um it's true. It's like, I always feel like the people that work on the projects, it's, you know, it's like you come together, I've called it like, you know, a band or something because it feels like you're in a, in a band and everybody's doing, have, you know, doing their part. And so it produces something that is like, in a way unique to the particular individuals that are working on that too, because they contributed to it. Um, and so, you know, you can, I, I always feel like the contribution of the team members is very important um, to each project. Um, and we, we, so we collaborate and then we spend time together, at least we did in person, <laughs> um, yeah. every summer going to camp together, um, um, where we would take some time off just to be together in nature, um, and, and so this builds like trust in the community, our community. And, and then um, I think that's a good way to bring out the best um, ideas. And, and I, I do, I think that's stronger than uh, creating a more um, vitriolic or Darwinian type of atmosphere, I would say. <laughs> and it, well, I mean, it feels like it's informed the aesthetic of your projects. I was really intrigued actually by starting to kind of pay attention more to how these projects look collectively because of the way they've been brought together in the book. But, you know, in the introduction, you sort of mentioned this thing about there not being a, a kind of studio gang style almost, or that every project exists on its own, um, on its own terms. And, and then hearing during your talk, um, uh, you know, this notion of that you didn't think that you'd ever build a tower. Um, so to sort of feel the sort of genie gang style in a tower form, it suddenly takes on a whole new kind of interesting um, thing, really. Um, 
And so how, I mean, how do you, we ask this in our, so I, this, this question kind of comes from a sort of personal agenda, because in our practice, we ask a lot, like, what is an assembled project? Why would we take this on? What will make this an assembled project? Because um, we don't feel like we have a clear aesthetic. I think other people probably do. Um, but how do you, how would you kind of characterize a, a studio gang project? Yeah, I, it's important in that situation of like taking on a project um, to be able to, for me, um, to be able to problematize the project. In other words, what could it do? You know, what 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 can be studied through this project? You know, and that, and and um, you know, could it? If one were to, you know, we we do get now. Luckily, I feel very you know lucky and privileged, I guess, to be able to get um, projects that we we can't do all of the projects that come our way. Um, but we still have to think about why would we do this, and and um, is it does it have a special ambition about something? Is it does it bring together to things that we want to see coming together um, from a, like a typological standpoint, for example. Uh, so um, we, we, I guess we, we talk about it, it's about its potential, um, even if it doesn't seem like it at first, it might, it might be the place that, that really um, needs something. Like I was very fascinated with Memphis um, just as a city. Um, it's troubled past but all of its potential and its youth and and um so it was really the place that that drew us to memphis and um so yeah it could be various things but it but we do have these discussions and it, it's a great it's a great question because it's it's very important what you decide to do and you know and who you decide to do it with you know <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I, I thought it was really, um, you know, felt really, it really resonated with what you said when you introduced the first project, Stone Stories, about um, ownership, mm -hmm. um, a project feeling through participation, through the process of making, that it's actually cared for and owned, that gives a project longevity. Um, do you visit your projects later? Are you still involved in any way with the work that you've done? Um, yeah, most of our projects are still connected to the people, you know, although that also does change with some projects. I mean, the, the um, people might change over time, new director, new this or that. But um, for the most part, almost, you know, most, I think every project that I've worked on, I'm still in contact with someone from the project and, and go there on occasion when I can, for sure. I think definitely with such a strong, strong sense of, um, I don't know, sort of material experimentation, innovation even. It's so interesting to see how the work ages as well, especially with natural um, materials. Um, and what I really like about this book is how many construction photos that show. Um, often architects are kind of written out at that stage, at least in the UK. Uh, you know, you oh. Oh, um, that's interesting. No, because no, I found that um, you know so there was a point in in time where um, you know there was the trend was that you know once you have kind of some recognition, um, you start just associating with other architects and having them do the construction drawings, and uh, this is a trend that I, has increased. And I remember exactly when, um, um, you know, uh, there's many reasons for associating with other architects. And I actually really like doing that, but I didn't want to give up the construction drawings, um, you know, because there's so much design that goes all the way through a project from beginning to end. And, and sometimes you have the innovation is uh, the most innovative thing about the project could that actually happen during that phase um, and you build in your office expertise about technical expertise and and the experience of building 
And I just didn't want to give that up. Uh, I think it's very, it's so key to our work and how it, it looks and how it, you know, plus I just, I love being on the building, on the job site. So, 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 so we, we didn't do, so we do consequently fewer pro- projects probably than my peers that, that do the other way. Uh, they can crank through so many competitions and, um, I, and I, you know, we don't, we have to be more careful about what we take on and we, and we really, when we take it on, it really is, you know, from beginning to end, even if we are associating with someone, we'll still stay there into the end. Yeah. And I suppose just speaking briefly about, well, the sort of kind of upcoming projects of Studio Gang, because in the book, there's quite a few projects that are unbuilt. Um, It's not only the last 20 years, but kind of the next 10 years in some cases. Um, How much of what we can see of Studio Gang now is actually the past? And how much of Studio Gang in the office every day are you actually kind of ahead of us all, kind of living in the future? Oh, yeah. I mean, right. I mean, it's, there's the process of your own evolution, right? That, that you learn things as you go and you get interested, but then there's the process of the context or the, the context changes, right? And so now what I've seen, I, I felt when we were doing this book, it was pre, you know, pandemic, obviously. And, um, um, the, but the issues that are present in our in our practice, they're they're only they only have become more important than ever, um, and I think I feel like the book is so timely. Uh, the practice is is timely. Is very you know as we hit our stride right now, it's really the moment of where we really have to be hitting our stride because. It's it's such a an, a crucial um, moment for all of us, you know. And so, I, I feel like the context is has accelerated uh, this change that will need to take place. Yeah, definitely. I think probably that's probably a good note to end it on. I think we've just overrun on time slightly, but um, I want to thank. Well, Jeannie, first for taking time during what I know is her holiday uh, to speak to us all. Um, And I think also for situating the book itself in the present context, I think it gives it a whole new reading. And for any students and architects, I think it gives a really clear, tangible way of building that might start to answer some of the questions that do feel slightly too big sometimes. so thanks to the audience as well um, and to the sponsors uh, Beecher Bathrooms for partnering with the RIBA um, on this event. Um, and so you might want to I'll just bring it up again, although you have it in front of you, but um, you might want to get hold of a copy. Um, Fiden are offering this discount, which you can see on the screen uh, with a code. Um, and so thanks Jeannie for, for this. Um, personally been a pleasure to get to know your work uh, more over the last couple of weeks and speak to you for this event. Thanks, Um, Dean. It's been such a pleasure talking with you as well. I'm sure I'll I'll see you more in the future. Hopefully. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, bye everyone.